Gentlemen, the To Be Determined Show. We are live beyond Ringside Radio Network. I'm the Orc of Ominous, the architect of Interlake, and we have everybody on. This is going to be a hell of a shoe. Hell of a shoe indeed. We're hell just going to jump shoe. straight into it. Hell of a shoe. We're going to jump straight into it. You hear the man right there from across the pond, the producer, the mad producer, extraordinaire, Matt Denton. Matt, how you doing tonight? I'm doing okay, but I just want to give a shout out to Ubisoft because fuck them. I'm 24 years old. If I want to see Randy Marsh get an abortion, I'm going to see Randy Marsh get a fucking abortion. That's hilarious. Oh, Ubi stuff. Ubi! Ladies and gentlemen, the man that runs the, all the show here, he is the one that only the Magic City Motormouth. Beyond Ringside Zone, Fast City Lane. Eddie, how you doing tonight? Wonderfully well, enjoying a Colorado chicken salad from Firebirds and had probably one of the seven worst servers I've ever dealt with in my life. This person, their picture is in the Webster's Dictionary right beside the word inept. Two things. Hello. One, I don't believe you've ever touched a salad in your life, Tubby. And two, <laughs> and two, what kind of fucking dictionary do you have that has pictures? <laughs> Well, it's better than the one that you have that scratch and sniff. Hello, scratch and sniff shit. And you hear her giggling right there. She is our resident world champion, three-time NWA world champion. She is Rena Del Pile Driver, the queen of the dam, Tasha Simone. Tasha, how you doing tonight, sis? Welcome back. Thank you. Um, this is going to be the most relaxed thing I say all evening. If I never have to sit behind Eddie, D. James, and shaking his ass again, <laughs> it will be too soon. You're just jealous because I have more ass than you do. No, I'm not. Eddie, trust me. Oh, no, but baby, you got that ass. I'm off with my own pocket knife. Did I, and you, that man that just said, uh, that ass, he is our guest co-host tonight. He is doomed. Trevor, Eon, Doom, how you doing tonight? Doing good, because art is vital. Uh, we have a request yeah. for you to say that ass one more time. That ass? Can I also have him say yet. German sex dungeon? That must have been we're my first question, Matt. Wait, we're going to the sex dungeon? Really? Cool. Sex dungeon? Whoa, 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 whoa. This isn't beyond <laughs> ringside. You gotta... gotta can we talk okay, about sex so beyond ring beyond ring side, not beyond bedside. <laughs> I'm just going to jump right in there. Does anybody have hold anything on, hold that on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Yes. Yeah, before you say anything, our guest tonight is the grand design, Clyde Braddock, one half or one fourth of the Lunky Charms, one third, whatever we can say on here. One fourth of the Lunky Charms. Yeah, you know, you know the grand design. But Tasha, we're going to jump straight into it. I know what you want to say. Go for it now, sis. Okay, as Seth knows, because I'm sure I know what we've talked about on Beyond Ringside, uh, even though I have been MIA on there as well, I know that it's been discussed on To Be Determined. The iPay review for Global Championship Wrestling this past Saturday night in Pelham, Alabama. I want everybody to understand that in all of my years in professional wrestling, Saturday night was the first time that I got to be a professional wrestler witnessing professional wrestling from a fan's perspective. I had uh, the love of my life's children with me and uh, was... And they're fans. They're, they're fans of wrestling. One of them wanted, and talked about it all the way there, wanted nothing more than to meet Scott Steiner and shake his hand and meet MVP and shake his hand. And that's something that I'll touch on in a minute. But what I walked away with 
after watching professional wrestling from a fan's perspective was not only sadness in my heart, but a great deal of embarrassment for so-called veteran professional wrestlers who are too stupid to be embarrassed for themselves. And it's really sad. When I broke into the business, professional wrestlers all realized, and yes, there's always been assholes in professional wrestling, but even the assholes remembered the people who buy the tickets are the ones who put the money in their envelope. And that small child asking for an autograph, well, there's an adult behind them somewhere with money in their pocket. I saw a match. I saw a couple of matches that this happened in, but one was a little closer to my heart than another one. I saw two so-called veterans of 20 years that the fans didn't even know. The fans started a chant, who are you? And all these so-called veterans wanted to do was make themselves look good because they forgot it's not about them. It's about professional wrestling. And if the entire match doesn't look good, nothing looks good. And what they did trying to embarrass somebody else was make themselves look bad along the way. And they basically wiped their ass with what professional wrestling is supposed to be. And I'm embarrassed for them. And Scott Steiner, I'm not calling out a lot of names. I'll let other people do this, but I'm going to say this openly. Scott, Scott Steiner doesn't care what anybody thinks about him. I know he doesn't. But he's a douchebag. I said it about Dallas Page when I watched him tell people that they had to pay ten dollars for an autograph on their piece of paper. I said it about Jake Roberts, and I'm going to go a step further with Scott Steiner. He is a bigger cunt than either one of them for two reasons. He didn't acknowledge children. He wouldn't shake their hand. He probably wanted ten dollars to shake their hand too. He wouldn't sign an autograph unless somebody paid for it. And then he got on the microphone in a group of fans in the ring that was heavily loaded with children and not only called a friend of mine, Amber O'Neill, a bitch three times. And a lot of people say he didn't say it, but I also heard him call her a cunt. He also called Luke Gallows a pussy. That is both unprofessional and uncalled for. And all that did, all of these combined efforts of these people who seem to forget nobody is bigger than professional wrestling, all that did was make a mockery of professional wrestling. It should have embarrassed everybody that was there that gave a damn. They should be embarrassed for themselves. And it's probably caused a few really good, solid wrestlers to not want to have anything to do with the business anymore. Because i got to be honest with you, I walked away hating professional wrestling after watching it from a fan's perspective. And what you're saying is you you were actually able to... Maybe once is that the first time in your uh, entire time you've been in this business you got to see it from a fan standpoint. That is the first and only time, and if I never do that again, it will be too soon. And you know, it's really, really sad when a child who was so excited, so excited to see Scott Steiner, to see Big Papa Pump and MVP. The first words out of his mouth weren't, wow, the matches were great. Wow, I saw some really cool people. The first words out of his mouth were, Scott Steiner's not a very nice person. That's horrible. That's a horrible reflection on the entire industry. The one shining light, the one saving grace that I saw, anybody who has the opportunity 
to go to any card that hosts MVP unless he would just change overnight. Not only did he shake hands and sign autographs and take pictures, he actually took the time to have conversations with people, children included. He was very gracious on the microphone after his and Micah's match, and professional wrestling needs more of that because his peers were certainly not that humble and gracious. I don't know why, but I'm not surprised uh, that you called Scott Steiner a douchebag. I mean, when it comes to professional wrestlers, they have to realize that if it wasn't for the fans, they wouldn't have anywhere to work and play their craft. Exactly. Scott Steiner, I don't know what it is about that dude, but I could tell from just a mile away that he is just, I want to say, an uncaring douchebag. The sad part is his brother's not like that. I told Wicked earlier in exactly these words, it's hard to believe they popped out of the same vagina. They're like, um, and it's true. Want to well, kind of thing, say guys. that they're kind of like a yin, a yin and a yang. Yin and yang. But here's yeah. the thing, though. Uh, Steiner backstage, I saw Red and Steiner three or four times. I never acknowledged him. He never acknowledged me. He just from the get go, you know, we had our we had our gimmick table set up with VIP. We were there. Us and the underground, we were prepared. We had our stuff ready for when the very first fan came in. He came in, kind of mingled through the fans. And then what everybody's forgetting to say is the fact that during the national anthem, he got up, and then that's when he decided to leave his VIP table. During the national anthem, he had all that time. We literally stopped signing autographs. We were forced to go to the back because the the matches were just about to start, and we had to go get ready. Uh I mean, we were signing we were signing autographs all the way to the back. Steiner decides during the national anthem to get his stuff up. And of course, you know Steiner's going to make a lot of noise and walk walk straight through the national anthem playing. Didn't even stop. Didn't even stop to acknowledge the national anthem, the flag, nothing. Walked straight to the back. Straight to the back. That's when he decided to clean up and leave. It was during the national anthem. But wait, that's not all. See, everybody thinks we're here bitching. It was a great event. You had. The fans come out. The VIP was awesome. The meet and greet was fantastic. Of course, Doom, Doom, get some shirts. Doom, you've got to get some shirts or, or something because everybody's like, where's Doom stuff? And then at one point, this is so funny. Dropkick Styles, who was sitting beside us, is like, look over there. It was, uh, Doom. It was, uh, Dylan Cook. It was, uh, what's Keith going by? The Bull? Whatever. And then, uh, Cassie Riley and, uh, and Chase Stevens, a uh, little boy, his little friend. And you guys were up there, I was like, that is about a mismatched fucking group if I ever saw it. And everybody's lined up to get Doom and Dylan's autograph, but it made it seem like they were there for them. Great stuff. Great I'm stuff. Just saying, I would pop okay, so. Awesome. Wait a minute. I just have to throw this out there. Trevor, how awesome is it? You should feel so, so ecstatic. That more people in Pelham, Alabama knew who you were <laughs> than, than, than who Chase and then Cassidy Riley were. <laughs> I can't and even. I can't even can't, process. But we're not. We're not exaggerating. Him. We're not kissing Zoom's ass because he was here. He literally got one of the biggest pops of the night besides MVP and Micah. That is a straight shoot. And even we, people people did not want to boo us. They were cheering for us over Cassidy and Chase. Yay, Junkyard Dog Memorial Tournament, let me tell you. But we're having to scratch the surface on that. Doom, the Battle Royal, how was it? It was fun. It was actually one of the most fun Battle Royals I've been in. And uh, I didn't know Joe was going to be there. So, yeah, you eliminated yourself. Threw yourself completely over the top rope to eliminate I yourself. Eliminated. To take out Joey. That was just. Oh, so all he wanted to do was beat up Joey Lightning. Oh, and he made sure that went straight after Joey. Oh yeah. 
Because I, I but, mean, uh, every time I'm supposed to wrestle him, he don't show up. Like, so it's like, what am I supposed to do? I didn't even know he was going to be there that night. So when he popped out of the freaking entrance room, I was like, oh, there he is. I'm just going to beat the crap out of him now. And he did. I forgot about winning the Battle Royal at that point. Anybody in the Battle Royal that you were kind of impressed with? Anybody that, you know, the fans, you're like, hmm, maybe somebody new, maybe somebody in the roster? Because that was a lot of new faces in that Battle Royal, sir. Uh, Dylan. Dylan has a lot of potential. And he, I think he stayed in longer than I did. Uh, of course, Xander's always. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Xander's Dylan. always amazing, so of course Xander's. I'm sorry. Dylan did great because he had a little short training session with me. I'm just saying. Uh, that explains that. How often do you get to roll around in the ring and actually have some type of training session with a with a world champion? Dylan, the sky is the limit with that guy. He has got so much potential, and I pulled him aside. As always, and I always tell him, man, I was like, this is for a DVD. you got to shine. you got to go out and do work. <gasps> is it true that Dylan Cook did more work? Then some of the quote unquote names on that card, I do believe so. I do believe so. Uh oh. Yeah. But uh of course the, the the Battle Royal was won by Antonio Garza. The Latin sensation. That was surprising. Yeah. Um I actually thought Styles was gonna win. You thought who was gonna win? I thought Styles was gonna win because he stayed in the freaking he came oh, out yeah. he came out like right after me. Well, I, I thought he was on Scotty Blaze, so I thought Scotty yeah. Blaze was going to do a thing because he was in there for a little bit, and then if, you know, once again, because of the 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 years that he's put in this business, and I know Scotty's been in a lot of battle rules, so you know, I, I kind of went with the, with the veteran, but uh, alas, Antonio Garza, another veteran, winning. Eddie, you had probably the best view of anybody besides uh, Doom. Uh, your thoughts on that battle royal and all the new faces? Start to finish, the battle royal, in my humble opinion, was solid. Um, somebody I wish could have actually – that would have had a little bit more of a chance to shine is Josephus Brody. This guy is great inside the ring, whether it be in a battle royal, whether it be singles tag. Um, all of the above, I've worked with on a number of different occasions, and he has always been that the professional. Guy, was that the guy that like, oh, built the butcher? Uh, look more like Bruiser Brody, yeah. Or Bruiser Brody, yeah. Wow. I watched Joe couldn't make a pimple on Brody's ass. But so it's the look, the look, Tasha, the look. We know that nobody can hold Brody's bag. I love Joe, but he wouldn't make a pimple on Frank Brody's ass. Is what I said. I had no, I had no idea who his who his uh, manager was because she wasn't a valet because she was actually out there managing. I felt so bad because we were up the of progress. And his wife, she come over, and, you know, she, like, touched me on the shoulder, like, hey, how are you? I had no idea who she was. So I was like, oh, how are you doing, ma'am? Instead of shaking her hand, I felt like a complete jackass when I saw her afterwards. I was like, oh, my God. I was like, she, she's a worker. Yeah, both she and, um, both she and Josephus have made it, um, I think, about four or five, about four appearances with Global. Um, they worked the Southern Legends Fan Fest a few years ago, and actually uh, Josephus worked against Dutch Mantel one year at the, at the Fan Fest. And like I said, what? the guy has – yes – his wife is going to be attorney, just so you know. She's going to what? She is going. She's in law school. She's in law school. Holy crap! Nice. Yes. They're both. And she can have pound death. She got a what? She does a three hundred pound deadlift. Yo, she was in phenomenal shape. Yes. Yeah, she was. She was in great shape. But Eddie, back to the back to the battle royal. Uh, you were talking about uh, Josephus. Is his name? Yeah, Josephus, uh, Josephus Brody. We've also built him before as Bruiser Brody Jr., but um, he's more commonly known in this time, um, about the last couple of years, as Josephus Brody. Um, Dylan Cook. The <laughs> the sky's the limit for this kid. I mean, he's got a good head on his shoulders. He is listening. He is watching. He is learning. And if he continues to do those three things, uh, pretty much in that order, open your eyes and you will see, open your ears and you will hear, and apply those two with your heart and you will learn. And Dylan Cook is absolutely lighting it up. Um, I really kind of wish there could have been a little bit more. I, see, I would have liked to have seen uh, Trevor and Joey Lightning one-on-one -on -one, um, during the show, but with eight matches already on the card, um, 
I think yeah. Trevor and Joey, I think Trevor and Joey could have possibly did, um, I'm not going to say a show stealing match, but I'm going to damn sure say it will definitely get and keep their attention because that crowd man. at the Pacific complex was hot and I loved it. Eddie, I'm just going to tell you this, man. Violent, I, it's going to be violent. It's got to be a dog collar match or something, man. You guys uh, still cage some, he has got to quit running. That's, that's all I'm saying. But d- I want to ask it really, sir. I have an idea. Why don't they all think Will Owens on a pole match? Oh, my God. No, look, no Wild Thing Will Owens references for the rest of the show. <laughs> Tasha, you got to actually uh, spar with uh, Dylan or, you know, actually get in the ring with him for a second. Your thoughts on this kid? Because that's what he is. He's a kid. I think we lost her. We probably did lose Tasha. Her phone was fading in and out. No. Uh, Dylan. <laughs> now, Doom, mm-hmm. you eliminated yourself to take out Joey. Yeah. During the process, did Joey did Joey even get in the ring? Yeah, Joey did get in the ring, didn't he? Yeah. He got in the ring, but as soon as he got in, I jumped on him. <laughs> <laughs> he, was all, he, was, he, he spent most of the battle roll on his back because I was kicking him and He'd get back up, and I'd knock him back down, and he'd try to throw me out, but nobody could actually eliminate me. If you if you watch the match today, I came back in the ring five or six times just from people jumping on me from behind and throwing me out. I just put myself back over. I'm kind of hard to eliminate, which I'm totally proud of. So, so we're here. So we're here. Yes, sir. Actually, one other match that I really think would have done remarkably well at um, WrestleFest, uh, bringing Doom back into play, and don't let your head get too big, kid. <laughs> um, actually, I would have liked to have seen the, uh, the idea of Trevor Eon versus Mike Posey. I think that one would have lit the place up. That would have been awesome. Every time I wrestle him, it's good. It's always yeah. good. Even whether I win or lose or whatever, it's always it's always good. So, the only the thing, thing about- that was missing. Yes, Go sir. ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say the only thing missing from the Battle Royal was me. I should have been in the Battle Royal. Yeah. That's a scary you thought. The last yeah, because awesome. yes, I know because you know I had your back. I had your back the entire way, probably because I rode up there with you and, and back with you. But still, <laughs> it's <just> true. <laughs> I love you. We're like family. We're like family. No matter what, Doom does fall under the Merchants of Death umbrella. Oh my God, did I break kayfabe? Maybe who gives a shit? It's my fucking show. I'll say what the fuck I want to. But <laughs> but uh, closing thoughts on uh, the Battle Royal, Eddie. The only thing that I would have changed, now there were 14 individuals in the Battle Royal, and honestly, from start to finish, it was fun to watch. I just wish that there could have been a little bit more time in between entrance. When the boss came to me and said 30 seconds, I'm sitting back going, they're not going to be able to make it from the entrance way to the ring in 30 seconds. It's going to look like the cavalcade of stars on a Dean Martin celebrity roast. And the... I just wish that everybody could have had a little bit more time to get in because everybody who was in it has things that they can bring to the table without taking away from the premise of a battle royal or even a rumble royal style match. Um, but honestly, the only thing that I would change was give them a little bit more time because you have so, you have some great up and comers, you have some great stars, and you have a lot of people in that ring that were definitely continuing to get even better than they already are. Like me. <laughs> Wick. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, Doom. Closing <laughs> thoughts on the Battle Royal, sir. No, I'm sorry. Um. I wish I could have won, but uh, huh. obviously my my rage got the better of me. But uh, that's how I am. So until I've kicked Joey's face so hard that his brakes fall out, I won't be satisfied. <laughs> so if he if he shows up in anything, I mean that's where my focus is going to be for now. But uh, it was a fun match to be in. There's a lot of good there's a lot of good talent in there, and uh, new people that I've never cross paths with like Josephus, who I thought was freaking awesome. And um, people I don't get to wrestle as often like Styles and Xander who are both always awesome. New people like Dylan. People like Mike Posey, even though he came out and I didn't even see him because I think I was gone already. <laughs> and uh, I'd love to do it again. My only thing about I'm the battle rule like Eddie said 
more time. I wish Doom yeah. would have stayed in longer, not illuminated himself, because a lot of kids were there to see Doom. Uh, I always feel like that takes away from the fans, you know, because like, <clears throat> fans are like, this is the only time I get to see Doom all month, and he just eliminated himself. Wow. Mommy, yeah. I want to go now. I want to go home now, Mommy. And there were no charms and no wicked nemesis in there. So Braddock should have been able to go in there. Chris and Braddock should have. But anyways, when we come back, we're going to take our first break of the evening. When we come back, the Grand Design Clyde Braddock will be joining us right here. The To Be Determined Show live beyond ringside radio network. We are live and back on the Tribute Determined Show, Beyond Side Radio Network. Fuck your tea. That is Doom. That is Doom making tea. That is Matt didn't say fuck your tea. And from England, I think the man knows a little bit about his tea. Bassy Lane here as well. And we're joined by we're joined by our guest tonight, the Grand Design, one fourth of the Unlucky Charms, Clyde Braddock. Clyde, how are you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing great, man. How about you guys? Do it fantastic. Obviously, Doom is getting a tray of ice. Yep. <laughs> that sounds like no tea I've ever made. Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah, me hating on my tea, shoddy. <laughs> but, Clyde, uh, Did we're you going to jump into it. I swear I'm fucking taller than you. Why don't you, why don't you open your mouth and we'll make some tea real quick, okay? All right. Wow. Here we go. Clyde, this past Saturday... If you will, tell everyone your thoughts on what happened in the tag match. We know you had to be PC. You don't want to lose your, you know, quote-unquote spot, but go right ahead, sir. Well, this is, this is how I look at it, okay? All right, what happened, what happened with the hot shots was luck, okay? And one thing about luck is that it runs out. And the unlucky charms, we'd never back down from a fight. And you know what? Anytime, anytime that, uh, that they want another piece of us, they can bring, they can bring it on because, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I respected them a little bit too much, but next time it won't be so. I'll go in there and wrestle them just like I do everybody else. Now, I have told them, and I will say this, that is the last time that there is that total disregard and that total disrespect for any of us. I said this, and I want this to be loud as anybody can say it. You quote me, whatever. Quote me, boy, because I'm about to say shit. The next time something like that happens, Clyde Braddock or Chris Knox is going to take whoever doesn't want to do work into the ring, into the middle of the ring, and tap them out. And I've been saying this. I gl- I grabbed Clyde by his fucking kick pads. I said, Clyde, if you do not get in the fucking ring and do something, I'm going to take us out, and we're going to get counted out. Clyde said, yes, sir. Clyde went in the ring, got he got tagged, went in, and Cassidy sandbagged him. And Clyde, the grand design, still hit a judo hip toss, a shoot judo hip toss on Cassidy and Cassidy about shit him, himself. Did Cassidy say anything to you when you took him down? Besides, please stop. No, I mean because because uh, all I did was I, I went to throw him, and he tried he tried to sandbag me. He didn't go with it, so I took him over. And yeah, you know, no I sand- mean, hold on. For those who don't know, sandbagging means that they throw all their weight down so you can't lift them up. Same thing that happened with Chris when, uh, with Cassidy when he tried to sandbag him, and Chris hit him with the fisherman's uh, release suplex. So, go ahead, sir. Yes, but I mean, I'm I'm just ready to get another shot at him. You know, I mean, if they want to if they want to play that game, then then I'm on the same page with them. But I had to ask I had to ask your thoughts on this because we just want to go ahead and get that out of the way because uh, you did show them 
a lot of respect. So did Chris. You guys showed him a lot of respect. Uh, you guys handled it a lot better than I did, obviously. So, so with that being said, <laughs> with that being said, uh, this Saturday you have quite the opportunity. Doom, our our, our brother Doom, who has you an opportunity at Empire Wrestling this Saturday in Rossville, Georgia. Now, we don't know who your opponent is, nor does it matter. What do you have to say to everyone that doesn't know who you are, that doesn't really know about your work, sir, and what's going to happen in Rossville, Georgia? Well, I'm I'm just going to right off the bat say whoever gets in the ring with me they're getting thrown around i don't care who it is you're getting thrown around you could be you could be 100 pounds or you could be 700 pounds you're getting thrown all over the ring i mean you know and and i got another thing to tell them full metal jacket you're gonna know what it is whenever you get hit with it because you're not getting back up i promise you i've been hit with it you don't want to be hit with it because i've been hit with it it hurts Now your Russian neck drop that you do, or Russian, uh, what what do you call the Russian uh, body toss? It's uh, the reverse body throw. It was, uh, you know, made famous by Alexander Karelin. You know, it's a big move used in Greco-Roman wrestling, which I'm a huge fan of. You know, I mean, those guys really, you know, they really work hard, very, very, very hard. You know, to be in the Olympics and all that, but. The, the reverse body throw, I mean, he would just, he would just kill people with it. They wouldn't, they, there was no defense against it. No matter how big they were in the Olympics, he would just toss them. I mean, he was undefeated. He was undefeated for 14 years. I mean, come on. And he hadn't been scored on in 10 years and he was just devastating as a heavyweight wrestler. And I got that move from him. And if it worked for him, it's going to work for me. Now, uh, this is a big opportunity. It's very hard to get into Empire Wrestling. Uh, those guys are a very close-knit uh, group. How do you feel being able to get such an opportunity that, I mean, they haven't let many outsiders, and that's what we are. We are outsiders. How do you feel about that? Uh, Andrew Alexander and these guys give an opportunity. And big props to Doom for actually uh, getting the, the connection with that. How do you feel being able to get such an opportunity that, I mean, they haven't let many outsiders, and that's what we are. We are outsiders. How do you feel about that? Uh, Andrew Alexander and these guys give an opportunity. And big props to Doom for actually uh, getting the, the connection with that. What did yeah, you? I mean, I, I wrote it in the I chat. I see, I see that. We lost <laughs> Doom. I'm all right. Sorry. I'm looking at the chat now. Sorry, we have production chat. Jesus Christ. Price of Latter-day Saints. Pay Clyde, yeah, yeah. Now, Clyde, Clyde, you have actually been in the ring with Doom. Uh, your thoughts on Doom and, and his fucking work ethic makes me sick. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, I mean, well, well, you know, I mean, he's a great, he's a great athlete. You know, I, I prefer more wrestling. Than, than punch him. But, you know, to each his own. I don't punch. I throw forearm strikes. Really? Yes, yeah, forearm strikes. Forearm strikes, whatever you would like to call it. But they're really, really Whatever you'd like to call it. Really the firm or wrestling. <laughs> Forget your roots. I mean, they just wrestling uh, on the park. How do you how do you challenge somebody, Doom, like Clyde that has the map prowess that he does? I mean, how do you counter that? You don't let him get you don't let him get on the ground. Because uh, last time last time I wrestled him. Once he grabbed me, that was it. He, he just like freaking Van Geese from Street Fighter. He grabs you. That's happening. Oh, right there. Yeah. 
stay away from that. Luckily, I'm freaking Sonic the Hedgehog, so. But I feel sorry for everybody who's not Sonic the Hedgehog. Because uh, whoever he's running on the Empire, if, if, I mean, you're not going to wrestle him. You're trying to wrestle Clyde, you might as well be trying to stop him. Armored car with a daisy, but, yeah, but they're kind of screwed. Cause uh, I mean, it, I run across a lot of people who did amateur wrestling or did some form of wrestling before now, where I was doing boxing and kickboxing. So it's, I just try to do the same thing with guys can freaking ground that I deal with. Back in boxing and kickboxing, I try to keep them away from me. I try to use the fact that I actually got three long arms, three long legs for somebody my size to my advantage. And uh, those are, uh, those palm strikes and elbow strikes and kicks and stuff, all that stuff comes in handy when you can't get close to somebody. It's very good if you know how to use them far away. My legs are as long as freaking spirals, and I can really do some damage. Uh, yeah. Clyde, yeah. Clyde, how do you how do you counter somebody like Doom that is so prevalent with his kicks that is such a kick artist? Uh, how do you counter with that in the ring? Well, I mean, you can't you can't chop down an oak tree by yourself with one axe. Okay, I mean you you can kick me. Uh, Oh, you want to, but eventually yeah, I'm going to get through all of that. And once I get my hands on you, it's over with. It's done. No, I'm, that confident. I'm that confident. I'm that confident. I'm that confident in my wrestling ability that whenever, whenever I get my hands on you, it's over. It's over. Then I have the yeah, upper hand. Yeah. Now I can take. I I can take some shots. I could be like George Foreman and and fight for 16 rounds. And 14 of those rounds, you get your head beat in and look like uh, look like the elephant man. But, but but after all that, after all that happens, I'm gonna take a beat. But once I get my hands on, it's over. And he's right. A nope. guy like, like Clyde, that your only option is to try your best to knock him out. If you can't, once he gets past whatever you're doing, he's going to kill you. Matt, you he's have watched a lot of... Matt, you have watched a lot of amateur wrestling, a lot of uh, uh, old school wrestlers, a lot of... Uh, especially out of England. Uh, your thoughts on somebody when you... Uh, someone with a Matt Prowlis and amateur background. Uh, do you prefer that, or do you prefer someone that uh, as Doom that has a kickboxing background that you know, can run, jump, uh, and is very prevalent with his uh, strikes? Uh, I can go either way. It depends. If you can throw a dude around, fan fantastic. I like to see dudes getting thrown like they're fucking babies or some shit. Throw a baby around. Don't care. Um, running, jumping, and kickboxing. I'm fine with that too. As long as somebody's getting hurt, I don't care. <laughs> oh, just beat the shit out of each other. <laughs> there you yeah. go. Now, Eddie, you yes. had a fantastic... I can't remember if... We, I think it was last Wednesday when we were on air when we were doing our, uh, our back and forth, our Smodcast version of... Uh, of the YouTube Determined Show, you made a, a very good remark about uh, Braddock. You said that I feel that Braddock being called the Grand Design was kind of a hefty, a weighty moniker to put on someone uh, so young in the business. Right. After watching what happened this past Saturday, uh, your thoughts on that, do you still feel the same way with Clyde, or do, uh, do you think you still need to see a little bit more? Let me go ahead and run this for those who do not know. I want you to imagine 
a Humvee with the navigational capacity of a snowboard. You put that together and you have got the mobile status of Clyde Braddock. He's got the physical size and the stature, but he can move on a dime. If you think you've got him coming straight at you, you better think again. Because he can shift directions and hit you from the side faster than a 24-car pileup on I-285 in Atlanta. Not to mention the fact that he's got great amateur skills. Not to mention that he also brings additional skill sets and disciplines into the wrestling ring. Now, I did mean when I said that I felt that the grand design was a whole lot to put on his shoulders. But I've also been watching Clyde Braddock for a while. Because here's the thing. When you've got somebody who is still relatively young, I'm not going to say new, but I'm going to say young in the world of pro wrestling. For them to get that kind of accolade, that kind of, I'm trying to think the easy way to say it. I don't want to use the word moniker, but I do want to say, I think he is growing into it quite nicely. Did I answer your question or am I still running for Supreme Court office? That's, not, that's that's pretty good. Uh, I I wouldn't say running. I'd say waddling in your case. Uh, no, just toddling very fast. <laughs> I just said running. That's pretty funny. Uh, waddling. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Uh, Thank you, Burgess Meredith, my favorite one. Uh, but you got to see uh, uh Clyde this past Saturday. Uh, any anything you want to say to Clyde, maybe to help him out something that you saw. Uh, well, actually, we lost him off the line, or I, I definitely would. Uh, all right. There you go. <laughs> but in all sincerity, I'll put... And he's back. Coolness. I will say this. Patience is a virtue in the world of professional wrestling. When you're dealing with individuals that don't want to do business with you, and you know that what they're... You know they're basically trying to BS you, the first instinct is, oh, no, the hell you didn't. And I think... <laughs> Yeah, I know, because a lot of people from our school of thought would sit back and go, "Mm hmm, yeah, that's one. You get one more because there will be no third time. Third time's not the charm. The second time is your downfall, yachts. And I think, and I'm just going to go ahead and throw caution to the wind and, and yank the curtain straight to hell and back. I think you and Chris handled the situation admirably. I'm quite surprised that there probably weren't about 48 teeth lying around the front two to three rows because I think y'all showed tremendous restraint, great discipline, and a huge amount of professionalism coming out of this past Saturday night. There were lessons learned that people, unless they know what to look for, will never see. But I honestly think that you and Chris learned a hell of a lot about certain individuals this past Saturday night in Pelham, Alabama. My brother, my hat is off to you, and I mean that in the most sincere way that you have ever heard me speak. Now, Braddock, you were coming off an injury sustained. If you will, since the last time we had you on, tell everyone what happened with this injury and when it occurred. Well, um, whenever I was... uh I, I broke my foot, and uh, I was wrestling. Who was I wrestling? It's happened. It's happened a while ago. So, I believe the equalizer. No, it wasn't. It wasn't the equalizer. It was. Uh, uh, anyway, anyway. Well, I went to. Uh, I went to splash him in the corner, and my foot got caught up under me somehow, and I broke my foot. And I had to have and I had to have surgery on it, and they put a screw in it and put the bones back together, like they should be. So it's working a hundred percent now. So I mean, it was. It I mean, it happened. It it's wrestling. You're gonna you're gonna get hurt in it. There's no way around it. So. You know, all you can do is you keep on you keep on pushing through it. How has it felt to uh to be vaulted into uh what you have so far with the unlucky charms? 
Well, it's a, 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 to me, it's an honor and a privilege to to be able to be able to be with you guys. And uh, you know, I mean, I I really I, I feel bad about uh, Damon Taz that he, you know, that it, it's just time for for him to hand over the reins. And, you know, it sucks that, that it's like that, but I'm just glad that he could do it to me, and I won't let him down. You know, I'm going to keep keep working just as hard as he did with the Unlucky Charms, and and we will be back on top, and we will have those GCW titles around our waist to bring them back home to the Unlucky Charms. What does 2014 hold for Clyde Braddock? What are some of your goals? For me? Well, I mean, first, first, I want us to get those those tag titles because I feel like that they're at home with the unlucky charms. I mean, watching watching those guys wrestle and them them having the tag titles and keeping them for a while and and all that, and them always going back to them. Even if they do get caught off guard and they and they lose them, they get them back. So I feel like they're at home, and I want them to stay at home with the unlucky show arms. So, you know, and I'm willing to, I'm willing to do anything for that to happen. But that's the first on on my agenda. And you know, whatever whatever the future holds with the unlucky charms, you know, I'm going to be about you guys, and you know do my best for you guys okay the mask who made the mask and where did that design come from well um my fiance amanda she made the she made the mask and uh i basically told her i was like you know i want you to kind of what what she thinks of, of me and my wrestling personality and all that and how I really am, you know, sometimes on the inside, whenever I, whenever I get in the ring, you know, even though, even though I respect everyone and I, and I give them the most respect even for stepping in the ring, but at that time, I hate them. They're, they're going to go down. You know, that I will be the last one standing in the middle of the ring. You know, and I try to do that every single time that I wrestle. And that's the hate on the front of it. And, you know, the the stitching like Frankenstein or, or as you put it, as you put it, Braddockstein, if you will. You know, I just, uh, I like. You know, she put that, and you know, I, I gave her those ideas, and she ran with it. And the hate on the forehead is, you know, the hate that I feel towards towards my opponent. You know, it's nothing, it's nothing personal. But when you step in that ring, you're stepping in my home and my sanctuary. I 100% agree with that. I wanna, uh say that uh, and I'm pretty sure Mike kind of drilled that into our heads when he was training us too but uh, it doesn't matter if it's your friend or whatever there's only one first place there's only one championship only one person to be champion at a time so I don't care if you're my friend or not uh, you're standing in the way of what I want so yeah I hate you until the bell rings exactly exactly and it's nothing it's nothing personal to anybody. No, not at but, all. But, I mean, but it's still a competition. Yeah. And, you know, there has to be a winner and there has to be a loser. So I'm going to do my best to be the winner. Exactly. Yeah. Parting words for for the Unlucky Charms fans, the three fans we have out there. <laughs> <laughs> three fans we have out there. <laughs> Okay, five. Yeah, I know. I, yeah, I know. I know. In, including uh, including Peanut, you know, he's definitely one of our one of our biggest fans. I hope he, I hope he <laughs> listens yeah. to this. I, I hope he listens to this because I hope he crapped his old pants whenever I, whenever I raised my hand to him because he looked like he did. Okay. Holy crap! He, he ran. Like he jumped back five feet when Braddock 
ra- all Brad did was raise his hand, and Peanut took off. I've never seen Peanut run before, but he did. Yeah, he never runs from anybody, but he, like, you scared the crap out of him. <laughs> It was I don't think anybody knows how to take Brad again is what it is. They're like, holy crap, this guy, you know, I mean, because when he come out, first of all, how everything was handled about you, you know, us coming out, everybody knowing who was, yeah, that was kind of weird how that was handled. But uh, you are in the fold. You are one of the unlucky charms, as you said. Luck runs out. Unluck is forever. Clyde, thank you for coming on with us tonight. We we do appreciate it, sir. Uh, how can everyone get in touch with you uh, for bookings and et cetera? We know you don't have any social media, but maybe you... Yes, yeah, I don't have... Maybe my... Manager? Hmm? 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 My manager? Yes, my manager. We could... Hey, there you go. Hey, yeah. He's, He's on the line. Line. There you go. I was looking at you like, if you want bookings... We'll talk about that well, later. I didn't know. I didn't know if it was okay. Yes, if you want to book Clyde Braddock, and if you want to book Chris Knox or Tasha Simone, I'm the man to get in touch with right here, the Wicked Nemesis. Braddock, thank you for coming on. We appreciate it. See you Saturday, yeah. Rossville, Georgia, Empire Wrestling. They have no idea. Thank you, Braddock, for coming on, sir. Yes, yes. Is there any is there any way I could get some closing words in to all of you, to all yes, the people sir. out there? You go right, right ahead. Well, I mean, yes. Uh, I just want everybody to know that Clyde Clyde Braddock is for real. I mean, this, you know, I'm not I'm not just somebody who who comes in off the streets and says that I want to do this. Wrestling is my life. Wrestling is what I've always been about. I've always loved it since I was a little kid. So you just better be ready because now that I'm with the Unlucky Charms, that's going to give me the push that I need, and we're going to be unstoppable. So. I'm just uh, I'm just giving you a fair warning that you better look out. Ew. Ladies and gentlemen, the grand design, Clyde Braddock. We're about to take our next break of the evening. When we come back, we're going to do a little bit in-depth with Doom, Trevor Eon. Right here, the Tube Determiners Show, Beyond Ringside Radio Network. Yeah, we're going blind into this like Ray Charles, not Stevie Wonder, because Stevie Wonder's not really blind, it's all a work. This is the To Be Determined Show right here beyond Ringside Radio Network. We are live with Doom Trevor Eon, Fast Eddie Lane, and Mad Dog Matt Denton. I am the Orc of Almost Architect and Elect. The Wicked Nemesis. We're about to talk about Hijack Raw. Okay. I miss Raw, so I have no idea except for what was put out on Twitter and a little bit on Facebook. Heard the first two hours were really, really good. The last hour could have been, eh. Uh, Matt, you and I were talking about this off air. We're going to jump right into it. Uh, what were your thoughts on this was Hijack Raw, whatever that... First of all, what is the Hijack Raw? For those that don't know it, not one of them. It, it's a bunch of fans who are pissed off that CM Punk's left. CM Punk's abandoned them, so they're gonna fucking hijack Raw by chanting CM Punk for fucking three hours straight because, hey, they have nothing better to do. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. That whole not- show was like randomly CM Punk. See, and I'm not, I'm not complaining. CM Punk's one of my favorite people to watch, so I'm not necessarily mad at him, but. Because they, the crowd was into, like, the other people who were really doing their job great. The crowd was into them, too. Like, mm-hmm. they still cheered when the Usos won the tag championships. Probably. Yes, they did. Yep. Man, those, those guys are an amazing freaking tag team. You see that damn dive over the ropes tag? That shit's crazy. That was beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Here's what fucking pisses me off so much about this. Is that when Stone Cold left, took his ball and went home, did did people from Texas go, Oh, we'll go hijack Raw now? Fuck no. Nope. How many people did you hear chant Stone Cold throughout a three hour show? Or attempt to anyway? Yeah. Well they do say what, you know, so They do yeah, what that is, but... that is Stone Cold pretty much. Can I offer this up? 
the, hold on a sec. The white chance really got on my fucking nerves. Like, a couple of weeks ago, I was watching Stone Cold get inducted into the Hall of Fame again. And the amount of fucking white chance made me want to go and strangle every fucking person in that audience. <laughs> what? <sighs> I'm gonna fucking kill you. But you'd enjoy that. <laughs> I didn't enjoy it's watching you try. It's it. fun. I'm not if, a person. I'm an entity. Amen. Oh, yeah, that just happened. If I can offer this up, WWE Creative, as well as whoever was running the show that night, whether it be Vince, Tripp, Steph, or whoever, did the right things at the right time during the first hour of that show. When Punk's music yeah. hit, and here comes Paul Heyman, that took 80% of the steam out of the hijack movement. Because they were with Heyman, and to watch the way Heyman worked that promo. He from start that promo. That promo was from amazing. From start to finish. That was a work of art, because he took it, and he held that crowd in the palm of his hand, and he made the transition from him to CM Punk to him to Brock Lesnar seamlessly. You, can, I don't know of anybody else on a national stage. There's your keynote right there. On a national stage that could have done that as well as Paul Heyman. Not even Vince McMahon himself could have pulled that promo. Ric Flair, Rock, Austin, Hogan, none of them. Go from there. When Lesnar came out, the crowd focused on him. They brought out the CM Punk chance a couple of times. Sure, why not? Keep it going. But then here we but he go. Used it to his advantage. He used it to, including your baby boy, CM Punk. That got the crowd back into it, but it got it on him, not WWE. Yes. And then they were they they check out. Here comes the tag title match. You knew in your heart. You knew if you had a clue about the way the storyline's been running between the Usos and the Outlaws, they were not going to string this for another five weeks to Mania or even four weeks to Mania. The payoff of the tag, the tag title change was going to be Monday night if they put those two back in the ring. And lo and behold, they did. The crowd in Chicago got a title change. There's very few things that people will bitch about on a title change. It's like, hey, we got a tag title change in, our, in Chicago. We're good. That took even more steam out. You bring out Big Ian Cesaro for the Intercontinental title. Yeah. You knew it. You know that Langston's not dropping that belt yet, but you know that Cesaro is going to give you something to cheer about. Oh, and hell yeah, did he. The catch that he made on Big E. Dude, and then he shifted him in midair? That was well, see, crazy. Okay, the catch and the first part of the shift was Cesaro. The second half of the shift, and you could see, was both Cesaro and Big E. They worked together on the final half of that shift. And the crowd respected that. But you go from there, you get Swagger jumping in, you got the DQ on Cesaro, Big E gets the win, the crowd's all over them. They're not all over WWE for CM Punk. And then here comes the Shield versus the Wyatt family. Armageddon's at it again. It took That's the crowd. That's just one-on-one -on -one right there. It took the crowd, and it kept them on the match. Oh, my God, we got a tag title change. We got Cesaro showing us stuff we haven't seen in WWE for a while. Now we get the Shield versus the Wyatt family in Chicago? Who? What? Oh, yeah, we're supposed to be pissed about something tonight, aren't we? Guess what? They took it right out from under them. The first 90 minutes of Raw was so perfectly placed. And then came the second half of the show. But by the second half of the show, that set the final 80 minutes, I'll say, when it was like TNA Senior, that's when the crowd started to get back into it. But by that time, they had already been screamed out by the action that they had been given in the ring. Mm-hmm. WWE diffused that bomb perfectly. 
and I dare anybody to say otherwise, for the first, for the first 100 minutes, seriously, yeah, 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 first 100 minutes, they did it right. But for that last 80, that show sucked. Matthew? Mm-hmm. I know you watched it. Anything you'd like to, um, is, have I, have I said anything wrong to, about that? I'm just looking through the results because I can barely remember anything, but, we'll um, see. yeah. Dude, I knew Daniel Bryan versus Batista was not going to amount to anything other than a beatdown of, of Daniel Bryan. And what they did, and the reason why I said <laughs> TNA Senior is because of the simple fact of the way that they did the beatdown of Daniel Bryan. I mean, it yeah. reminded me of TNA for the last five effing weeks. I got to agree with you there. Right, so, right, right at the end, right? So Daniel Bryan got beat down and shit. And then they go off air. I tune in to WD Network because I was able to get, get a hold of the free trial. Right. And I see them send out the big show and I could have just died laughing. Yeah, that's going to be a tag, to- uh, tag team match that's coming Friday night on SmackDown. It's already, be- it's already in the can. F- well, yeah. But no, it's just the fact that everybody's expecting CM Punk because the, the, thought process of the IWC was the fact that they had CM Punk be mentioned was some kind of sign that, oh, CM Punk's back again. And then there's Dave Meltzer saying, eh, he's probably coming back, but Dave doesn't believe her, blah, 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 blah. But Meltzer. then they send they send out the big show of all Meltzer. fucking people. These fucking business, pardon my language. Say so what? What was it? Meltzer got played like nobody's effing business. WWE's press department strung him perfectly. Here's the thing, though. Everybody says that Dave Meltzer said he, it was set in stone that CM Punk was coming back. He said no such thing. You're right, he didn't. But some of the other things that he said has, been, has come back on him, from what I've been told. I don't read his column. I don't know. I don't pay for the yeah, wrestling I don't, observer. I don't know what you guys are talking about. I'm totally lost. Say it again, Trev. I'm totally lost. I don't even know what you guys are talking about. Dave Meltzer, Wrestling Observer. Oh, what did he do? Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, <laughs> he, he, he said stuff, and it's coming back to haunt him, and nobody really gives a shit, apart from the people who still pay fourteen ninety nine. dollars was it, a month? Yeah. For, for a fucking, for a bunch of podcasts that you can now get for free, and fucking news that you can get for free from other websites. See, the trick to this whole scenario is when when Big Show made his entrance at, um, after the camera stopped. Once again, the fans in Chicago started to get a little bit more ticked during that third hour. It's kind of like everybody watching the Royal Rumble, starting with position number 24. And I still say, right, Rey Mysterio didn't get booed because they don't like him. Rey Mysterio got booed at number 30 because he wasn't Daniel Bryan. Well, they yeah, played. Ray the Charles could Ray, fucking see that. Rude. Because they pretty the much fact- set him up for fail there. Say again? They pretty much set him up for fail when he came out at number 30 and he wasn't Daniel Bryan. That could have been anybody. That could have been Stone Cold coming back and he would have got No, if it had been Austin, trust me, that crowd would have said, who? Because when you hear <laughs> the, 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 the... They say, we love you, Daniel Bryan, but we got Stone Cold. You can wait a minute. If the glass would have broken and Stone Cold Steve Austin would have come out number 30 in the Royal Rumble, the earth would have moved. I'm surprised that that's the reason Ray Mysterio came out, because he's, like, super popular. I don't think I never hear people. And like, not so much anymore. Ray Mysterio's Ray, really, fallen off. Ray was super over five years ago. Yeah. Ray's not yeah. super over now because he keeps getting hurt. He's hurt. He's going away. He'll be back in eight months. Okay, guess what? He's back again. When's he going to? It's like, how many times could the big show turn heel? Sure. Is he face or is he heel this week? It's lost its luster. It's lost its shine. It's lost its, you know, it's lost its surprise. It's like, oh man, big show turned. Wait a minute. Big show turned again. Oh shit. Here we go again. Ray's hurt. Okay. When's he coming back? But if it had been Austin or somebody of that magnitude, at number 30, like I said, the earth would have moved five feet from the IWC having a collective orgasm at that point. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, we got stone cold. Ooh, baby. I mean, am I wrong on that, Matt, Wick, Trev? Do y'all think I'm wrong? 
If that's your um, fucking O sound, then no wonder you're not getting laid. No, that's not my O sound. That's my sarcastic O sound. There's a difference. I, I think that's, didn't want to know that. I think he's probably things. either like Stone Cold, probably one of the one of maybe two or three people that could have come out at that point and actually got not crapped on by the crowd. There are three people in my mind right now that could have come out number thirty and not been crapped on. One, Austin. Two, Taker. Three, Shane McMahon. Yeah. No. Okay. No, I'm not the only person that thought Shane McMahon was actually a pretty good wrestler. I enjoyed watching him. He's, he good. was a damn workaholic. He wasn't so was bad crap. for a guy who was partly trained by Matt Hardy. And he works better than Matt Hardy. To be <laughs> fair, my right nut works better than Matt Hardy. That's something I really just don't care to see, but thank you, Matthew. Would I it be a mid show you. Was it going to be a mid like match? I Matt Hardy. Matt Hardy can, yeah. Do that. No, Matt I want to tell Matt Hardy to come down to GCW and wrestle me. It'd be awesome. Barf. Uh, Jesus Christ. Matt Hardy, maybe 2000 Matt Hardy? Sure. Matt Hardy today? Oh, fuck off. No, no, no. Really? Dude, I haven't seen him wrestle recently. He'll probably bad? take my comments right now and t- try and spin it into a little storyline. How he got hurt by comments from some guy on a radio show. <laughs> Woe is me, Matt Hardy. Fuck him. I'm going to say this. He used to come to GCW and attack me, and then he can wrestle each other. Trevor, if, there, if the front office of Global is going to spend as much money as Matt Hardy wants to come down to Pell City, I would rather them channel that money into somebody like AJ Styles or, get this, Michael Bennett. Oh, that'd be cool. I'd love to wrestle Mike Bennett, too. I think AJ's a better match for Spiral than he would be for somebody like me. Can AJ? you imagine the two of them? Holy crap. <laughs> oh, They're, shit. Talking of were, AJ. He Go broke ahead. a dude's neck. Uh, he broke a dude's neck this week. Oh, oh yeah. Wait a minute. What? What happened? There was um, a match, I think, in Scotland. AJ Styles versus Lionheart. Ooh. And um, Lionheart had his neck broken by the fucking typical Styles Clash botch. He didn't tuck yeah. his chin. He didn't relax his chin. He should have tucked his head back and not brought it forward. Yeah, that, that's like, what I mean. He tucked yeah. his chin, so he fucking snapped. Bang, broke his neck. Got pile yes. drivers, basically. Roderick basically. Strong. Roderick Strong, Stevie Richards, and I think Kazarian had that fucking... The trick to the Styles Clash is, you know, the basic rule of thumb in something like that is tuck your chin. No, you never tuck your chin on a Styles Clash. You lean back and you put your head as far back as you can. Yeah, because if you tuck your chin, you're gonna get, you're just going to come head. right down on, your frickin- yep. on the back of your neck. You're done. No, you're going to come down. You're going to tuck your head under your neck is what you're going to do if you come down tucking your face forward. Rock your head back. Yeah, that's that's terrifying. Yeah, I saw. I mean, I've still got the uh, Roderick Strong AJ Styles match on DVR, and I felt so bad for Rod. But the thing about it is, he's taken the Styles Clash a hundred times. He should know that by now. It's one of those heat of the moment things that just kind of happens sometimes, I guess. Unless it was supposed to be a false finish and they turned around and um, Roderick was supposed to bow out of it underneath before AJ could jump forward. But AJ had already jumped forward and Roderick was bringing his face forward. It's like, oh, crap, this is not it. Damn. Dude, I hope he's okay. At that point, there's nothing you can do but just take the move and hope for the best. Pray. I have a look at the uh, Roderick Strong bit now because I haven't seen it. Oh, yeah. I watched that like five or six times. They showed it this past Saturday night on uh, Ring of Honor television in our home market, uh, UPN 68. Yeah. Here we go. Step over, step over. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's what happened. (laughs) Jesus Christ. (laughs) Where's John Zandig where you fucking need him? No kidding. Jesus I mean, the next worst thing to that right there that pops into my head, other than Sid and the leg break, is the first time that somebody painfully, painfully botched the backflip coming out of the Doomsday device in 1986 on Crockett TV. 
Oh I, no, not the not the backflip off the shoulders. Oh. Yeah, the Tuesday device. Because remember, not only is Hawk going to throw. I mean, not only is Animal going to push you up and back. Not only is Hawk going to try to guide you a little bit, but you have to launch your happy ass to where you can go ahead and get to that layout position instead of coming down on the square of your shoulders. I think um, it wasn't Mike Boyette oh. that did it. It was. Oh, dude, and that reminded me of another one. Uh, UWF 1986, Savannah Jack Marshall, or Savannah da- uh, Jack, was facing um, the California hippie Mike Boyette. Um, Jack came in for a deep underhook arm drag, and apparently Boyette lost his footing when he was trying to go forward, and Jack kept pulling. Boyette came down on the side of his neck going down and did not move for a full segment. That's brutal. Yeah, I know. Still brutal. I think that would be the origin of Botchamania. The one that we all can agree on one thing. The one that I was remembering just now was when Marty Garner took the pedigree for the first time. Yes. That was nasty. Yeah. Yeah. From what I heard, it was like he was trying to. It wasn't even face first. He went top of the head first, but it was like. Yeah, yeah, that's what. Well, he tucked his chin on that. And it, he, he hit the back of his head almost like a, I don't know. Uh, you could, that's one of the few things I think you can still see on, uh, on YouTube. It's, yeah. on, it's definitely on one of those botch, like one of the first botch videos I ever saw. Oh yeah. Uh, that was the very first one. I, from but, what uh, I remember, he, he was supposed, he thought he was taking the tiger driver or some shit. Yeah. So it was like he, he turned himself into a fucking lawn dart. That's what he fucking did. <laughs> It's kind of like when you take the tombstone from Undertaker, nose to nuts, damn it. <laughs> well, look, there's one yeah. person. Uh, she's not here at the moment. Tasha, Tasha's pile driver. She is one of the nastiest pile drivers I've ever seen. Uh, that is a move that just even the slightest bit of hesitance, even the slightest bit of off, can totally end your life as you know it, as we have all seen. By, uh, several all, people get all I'm saying for the Undertaker's tombstone, if you can't smell Michelle McCool on Undertaker, exactly. then you're too far down. Nose to nuts. <laughs> That's gonna... you just that. What? Nose to nuts? That's what it is on Taker's no, pile. Huh? No, oh, like, no, Michelle McCool? No, the Michelle McCool the Undertaker. Oh, that was funny as hell. That was beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, but I want the other kicking my ass. <laughs> <laughs> and if you go a little bit lower, you can smell Layla. Oh, hello, Whoa. Doom. Uh, Whoa. What? What? Is, Doom? Is there any move that you that you won't take besides uh, the unlucky charms? Uh, top of the morning. Crazy, unstoppable death move. That you guys told me about. Uh, Dude, people. Uh, Xander took it. Well, you know, yeah, when, when we were training. I'm mad I didn't get to see it. But Xander's like, the, he's amazing. <laughs> you could probably hit Xander with a thunderbolt or a lightning bolt straight out of the sky, and he would pop back up and be like, oh, that's all you got? You. Xander would. Seriously, is there Xander any move that, uh, that, you're, that you're kind of scared to take or you refuse to take or hesitant to take? I got one. Um... Not necessarily. I'm very wary of pile drivers. Thank you. So if you're not like, if you're not like Mike, because I know Mike uses the cradle pile driver for a finisher. Package. If you're not Mike, or some, or just somebody who's just been doing it forever, and I like feel like I can trust you, there's a good chance that I'm gonna ask to just, can we do something else? Like, I, like Shane Williams gave me a pile driver. It was super safe and awesome and it looked good so I was like cool but I have not had one since then that was man that was my that was almost two years ago but everything else I'm I'm pretty cool with usually I'm I always kind of take it person to person so it depends on who I'm wrestling because a lot of like a lot of stuff I had never taken the German suplex before before I wrestled Mike but he's he's like best wrestler on earth, so <laughs> I was I wasn't worried. And he's my trainer, so I wasn't worried at all. But if he was just like one of those guys, you know, like the indie guys out here who are hitting big moves after big moves in each other every thirty seconds, those guys hit moves like that, and it, it just yeah, I I don't 
trust him like that. So, uh, no. I, I don't fucking blame you. I saw this um, animation of some fucking... Um, I think it was a tag team match. Some dude had a guy on the apron for a tombstone. Jumps See? off. His tag team partner's on the top rope and at the same time leaps off with a fucking double stomp through a table. But you're over... See, that's what I'm saying. Like, that's ridiculous. That's... You're overdoing it. That's not even, like... It goes... That goes far beyond... You're trying to kill somebody doing something like Exactly. That. And this is... We don't get a second take. There is no, you know, stunt doubles or nothing like that in wrestling. So you can't... You gotta be wary of... You, you want to win the match. You don't want to kill the guy. Here's two things. So One, like, they're probably going to get paid 20 bucks for that. Yeah. And And two... Yeah. If they really want to make it to WWE, they know that you don't see some kind of stupid fucking stunt like that on WWE TV. And you know what? I can sit. I can. I think about that every time I sit and try to brainstorm. Like, oh, what can I add to my arsenal? Because I know, like, I've been. That's been a thing that I've been working on a lot. Just I've been trying to add new things to my arsenal. But I always watch and see what they're doing on TV, and I'm just like, whoa. I don't need anything that they wouldn't let me use here. Because if I if somebody makes a highlight video for me and I got this big, crazy, ridiculous move that's so amazing, it don't matter because once you get to the big stage, everything changes. If they don't want you using that shit, then you can't fucking use it. So mm-hmm. I, try, I just try not to have anything in my arsenal that I know that they would look at me like, what the fuck would you do that? That's just yep. wishful thinking on my part and hoping for my future that that's where that's where my career goes. So I'm I'm always making reference to it. I'm always in everything I do. I'm always like, well, how does that how would that affect me if I was here or here? I, that's probably just how I am. But definitely, like crazy moves, you don't need them. You don't need a double backflip. You can backflip one time. You don't need a seven hundred and fifty. Thousand splash to four fifty is enough. Like just. Well, here, here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing. Like for various pile drivers, of course you can't use that WWE unless you're the Undertaker or something, <laughs> or if you're going CM Punk off the fucking rails or some shit. But it yeah. seems like um, WWE likes the kind of spectacular but safe <sighs> flippy shit, like Adrian Evan. Neville. In NXT with the corkscrew shooting stars press, sure it's unnecessary, yeah. but it's pretty as fucking hell. Evan Bourne. Well, he's the only one that does Evan, it. These guys Evan, out here, they're all doing it. It's true. Like all of them, the entire card is guys who do that, and they do all that. And then we got Spiral at GCW, whose splash is not a flipping crazy splash, and it looks ten times better and ten times more devastating than all their crazy flips. So it's just like. You guys go out and do all this, and then this guy comes out and does this splash, and there's no flips or anything, and it still looks way better than yours. It's time to reevaluate what you do. It's definitely you true. You don't want the crowd to get excited off of your moves. You want the crowd to be happy to see you. They, they That's shouldn't even turned out for what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. Turn down for what? We're about to take our last break of the evening. When we come back, we're going to talk to Doom a little bit more, and we're going to discuss Empire this weekend when we're seeing Red again, of course. The To Be Determined Show live beyond ringside radio network. So this is not the NXT arrival, but it is the To Be Determined show. We are live. Beyond Ringside Radio Network. Fuck Brian Christopher. (laughs) Oh, and by the way, uh, one of my favorite tweets of the week was, uh, Buff Bagwell shouldn't have been a gigolo. He should have been a juggalo. I love that. Apparently he's now one of the top three escorts for that fucking particular service. 
power too. One man. of the top three. He's the perfect stranger. No, I t- I, yeah, I'm Walmart surprised did. that that whenever they call up the fucking escort service, they don't put him through to Buff's mom. And actually, that's the handsome it, stranger, Wick. You have to go through Buff's mom, and it's the handsome stranger, not the perfect stranger, whatever. <laughs> yeah, global. I got wrestling. it right this morning. All right, yes. And there you go. But the handsome stranger indeed. American males. <laughs> American males. American males. American Me. males. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Buff. Daddy. Now, uh, Empire Wrestling this Saturday, Doom. Uh, yes. If you do, you know who you're actually working yet? I have no idea. I have. He has not told me yet. I guess I'll find out on Saturday. I don't mind not knowing. In fact, I almost kind of like not knowing. Because last time I didn't know who I was going to face when I got up there, and I ended up in the ring with their light heavyweight champion, uh, Johnny Viper. It was a fun, fun match. I was very proud of that match. I posted it on my Facebook and on my Twitter like a hundred times because I was very happy. I was very happy with it. I um made a bunch of mistakes in it, but nobody knows with me because <laughs> he didn't even realize. And I was uh but other than that, and every single time I've been up there, the crowd has been very receptive of me. I stayed after last time I went to Empire when I wrestled Johnny Black, I stayed after a good thirty or forty five minutes taking pictures and signing stuff. So I love going up there. I can't wait to go back. I've been trying to get back up there all year, so I'm excited. Somebody's been kicked oh. in the face. I don't think I've kicked anybody in the face up there yet. When was the last time you were actually there? That was early October, I think, when I went there. So this is going to be like my reintroduction. Because that was right before I broke my wrist, or tore all the muscles in my wrist, I should say. It's now, how hard was it? To, uh, how hard was it to come back from that type of injury? Uh, it was hard, but it wasn't. I started uh just working my legs pretty much every day. After I got over the frustration of having a hurt limb, because I spent that first week just being pissed off and brooding and walking around the house grumpy and yelling at the cats, <laughs> and then I just. You know, I snapped on the inside and said, fuck this, I can't work my arms. So I'm going to work my legs until I can't work my arms. So I was doing leg workouts four or five days a week, 30, 45 minutes at a time. Kept myself, like my leg. that's why my legs got bigger over the time I was hurt. And then over time, I just started to do real light weights with the wrist, a uh, small number of push-ups instead of a bajillion of them like I was doing before. It was a it was a rough process, and you know it still like hurts sometimes just because it's just because of the trauma from it landing the way I did. It was about a fifteen foot fall. I mean, you think about it, I was wrestling the dude who was like six ten. That's a long fall. You know the fact that I got up and got back in the ring in January means, means that I'm crazy. <laughs> but Cesaro wrestled with what, broken fingers or something. I'm like, if he wrestled with broken fingers, I ain't gonna be bitching about my wrist like that. Because while I'm sitting here complaining about my wrist hurts, these other people are out here honing their craft. So, difficult or not, I was ready to get back at it. But it was not. It was. It was. It was easier than I thought it was going to be. But it was still not necessarily very easy. Now I feel like I can come back now, to anything. I had a fan come up to me at the uh, at the VIP and say something that I wanted to pass along to you. Uh, as a female fan, she said that you made her want to be a uh, professional wrestling fan, which I thought spoke volumes. Because you know, there's not many people you can point to. Um, you made me want to punch you in the face. That's just, that's generally what I get. <laughs> but uh, how does it feel to be able to actually connect uh, with the fans like that? Because that's what a lot of uh, wrestlers uh, fail to do and are unable to do for the most part of their career. How are you able to connect to the fans like that? 
you know, I'm I'm really trying to figure that out myself. Honestly, I don't know what it is, but I'm, like every single time I go out and people react to me in general, I just on the inside I feel all warm and fuzzy and super awesome and stuff. And it's really a I don't even know. I can't point to one thing that can tell you why or what it is. I mean, I go out and I, I'm I'm myself turned up, I guess, to the whatever ninth degree, and I guess people, I guess people kind of like who I am, surprisingly, just shocks the crap out of me, <laughs> but uh, I don't know what it is that the, the crowd sees in me that makes them just want to get behind me, I'm totally, totally grateful that they want to do that, and uh, I'll hope that I make more people feel that way, hopefully I can carry that over to everywhere I go, so that we can make something out of this this Trevor Eon thing that we got going on here. But I'm still trying to figure it out. It's very, very, it's very interesting, but confusing. <laughs> it's like the Ninja like Kingdom to have. Yeah. Pretty much. I, I can never, and I, I can never have enough people tell me Oh yeah, you're awesome. You did this. I like your. A lot of people like like the color of my gear. A lot of people like the the eyes in my hands. A lot of people like my crazy hair. I feel like I look way less generic with this hair on my head. I'm so glad I grew my hair. Out. Great idea. Well, I think that's that's just a big love fest. What that is, a big love fest of art and violence. It's a big old love fest of art and violence. Everybody now. Now you you talk about art is violence. Where did this come from? The art is violence hashtag that you use that you uh, have been pushing and also using on Facebook. Okay, this is this is what happened. I was drawing and I was listening to music, and I was listening to a song by my absolute favorite band on earth, Angel Spit. If you don't know who they are. Google them right now, Angel Spit, A-N-G-E-L-S-P-I-T, one word. Look them up. If you don't know who they are, look them up. And they have a song called Violence. It sounds like nothing else in their catalog. Their music is usually really fast tempo, lots of crazy electronics and machinery and just wild, ridiculous chaos in their music. It sounds really violent. Like, their music sounds like a war zone. But this one song called Violence, at the very end of their last album, Hello, My Name Is, it's super calm, it's really sexy, it's real slow. The the Luke singing is super melodic. And something went off in my head, and I'm like, man, the music's like, it's like a war, it's like their music is violence. And then I started thinking of different ways that art itself was almost a violent act because then I started getting really crazy. When you put lines on the paper, I force those lines together. Those lines don't have any control over themselves. I'm in control of them. I tell them what to do with my pencil. The same thing with music. You force those sounds together. They don't sentiently come to life and choose to be together. It's coercion. It's just like violence. And eventually I came up with the slogan, Artist Violence. And now I've started to see, like, just fighting in general, violent acts. Like, if I, there's art to me kicking a guy in the face. There's a flair, there's a finesse to it, there's a flash to it. But at the end of the day, I'm kicking a guy in the face. There's art to me taking some guy's arm and trying to yank it out of the socket because I want to win this wrestling match. It sounds brutal, it sounds barbaric. But at the same time, it's actually very intelligent. It's very, it's very artistic, and uh, that's kind of where the artist violence thing came from. But but Angel Smith inspired it, like one hundred percent. If I had to point one thing out that put that in my head, it was listening to that Angel Smith song, and it just kind of went from there. And I've just been adding things to it as time goes on. 
because I mean, if people, anybody that's following me on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, they know that I'm super creative. I build stuff. I draw. I play music. I'm all over the place. Photography, freaking modeling. Even I'm ugly. Like just all kinds of random crap. So I just wanted to put that all together with wrestling and uh, make it one thing, so I could kind of. I don't know, try to keep myself from being boring because I can only come out and just yell doom for no reason for so long, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but... It's probably because you're the biggest fan of the WCW tag team. Of the what? Of the WCW tag team. Which one? Doom. Doom. Well, doom. I mean, who can not like the WCW tag team doom? Rod Simmons was there. Come on. Exactly. Damn. That's the reason you come out every week and just go, DOOM! Never Damn forget, right. man. Never forget. Damn right. Now, uh, what, do you, what are your goals? What are your goals for 2014? This year? I, I got my heart set on wrestling in places that I've never been. Florida... And like the northeastern, north north even, Florida, California, and the northeastern states are my main like focuses. That's where I want to go this year. I just want to come out and say, oh, I want to wrestle for New Japan, wrestle for WWE. Yeah, yeah, I do. Like right now, if they called me right now, I'd be gone. But <laughs> since I'm since uh, I'm not gonna jump too far ahead into the future and pretend like I can pull that shit off overnight. So small term, small term goals right now. I definitely want to get to states I haven't been to, but California, Florida, and like New York and that whole area. Those are my main. Those are my main focuses. That's what I really want to do before this year is over. So as many people as in as many places as possible will know my name. And I'm gonna start doing. I'm gonna start doing videos where I talk about a lot of this stuff soon. I just haven't done it yet because I had to find a good location and a good camera. But I have those things now. So in like a week or so, things will start popping up. I I keep very busy. Are you saying like a vlog? Are you going to start a vlog? Nah, I'm not going to start a vlog. It'll just be... uh, It'll kind of be just me talking about whatever I got going on. Like, if I got a thing going on with Joey, I might have something to say about it. I'll start recording it instead of just typing it on Facebook. Or instead of just tweeting, Joey, artist violence, I'm going to turn you into a song on this album of your device, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to start being a little more verbal than you just... Cause I don't feel like I get to talk enough, but I feel like I want to talk more. So instead of waiting to go to a wrestling event and see if the promoter's going to tell me, hey, you might have time to talk tonight. Instead of doing that, I'm just going to I'm gonna record it myself and whatever company I'm working for, I'll just put it on their Facebook profile so all the fans that are going to be at the show, they can all see it. I'm trying to get some more attention. This is what I'm doing here. People need to pay attention to Trevor Young. I work hard. I want to be good at what I do. I want more people to see what I do. Now, you had the honor of being a part of uh, Beyond Wrestling not too long ago over in Atlanta at WWA 4. Uh, tell us about that, if you will, because that's, that's pretty much art, or artistic anyways, wrestling. Yeah, that was awesome. It was absolutely amazing. I, um, I got to see and talk to a lot of people who I've either wanted to meet or had met before and just didn't have a lot of time to sit and talk with them. I got to watch friends of mine work like Dark Mon and uh, Fred Yeha, who I just wrestled last Friday, who I'm wrestling this Friday in Columbus, actually. And uh, I actually wrestled a girl. Uh, she's the, I think she, yeah, she's the AIWF Women's Champion right now. Her name is Devin Nicole. She's awesome. She came to GPW once, but she hasn't been back since. But she's a she's a lot of fun to wrestle, and she's super super duper cool. 
She beat me up. She dropped kicked me in the face. It hurt. <laughs> <laughs> she but, kicked uh, your face. <laughs> yeah, she kicked my face. But uh, just the whole everybody was everybody was super friendly. The guys were the beyond wrestling like taping experience. It's a really, really, it's a really, really cool experience. And having your peers watch you watch you work and having them react like fans is I think that's a that makes me feel really good as a wrestler. And me and Danny definitely got that with our match. Like it was one thing for guys to like pop about people's cool moves because they believe me, there were a lot of cool moves that night. And my match we didn't do all that. I was on a girl, we can't we can't do all this ridiculous crap. But our match had, like, the reaction as if those guys weren't wrestlers. It was almost like they were fans. And she noticed it, too. And just that is just an, in, it, it's an indescribable feeling, really. And then watching all these other people who have been wrestling longer than me, who know more than I do, who would freaking probably kill me in the ring, like, wrestle circles around me. So I'm humble enough to say that somebody can wrestle better than me. I'm not... I don't have much of an ego. Uh, attention to professional wrestling world. You guys can learn from that. No ego. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I got to, got to have people, have people who know more than me critique what I was doing. Like Aaron Epic gave me a lot of information afterwards. He's freaking cool. Shirley Duncan is freaking cool. Uh, Black Baron, the guy who asked me to be on the show to begin with, he's freaking awesome. And him and Matt Cage tore the damn house down at the end of the show. Tore the damn house down. Got to meet and watch Air Fox work again. He, I don't even know how he does the stuff he does. I'm just with you. But it was, it's an awesome experience. I recommend like anybody who's in, in any region as a pro wrestler, if you or if you think you can keep up with those guys, you definitely should try and freaking just go to Beyond Wrestling. And even if you don't get the, even if you don't get the work, just watch everybody else and just take in the atmosphere because it's an amazing atmosphere. And you know, me being a big art nerd, I was like, oh, this is crazy, crazy. It was like, is there anything you actually? Is there anything you learned from that uh, experience? Um, hmm, what did I learn in specifics? I learned, and this is just from watching everybody else, that it's, I think I picked up on maybe how to pace my match different from everybody else's. I kind of learned, like, that whole where you are on the card kind of affects how your match should be. That's what I picked up on. From that because a lot of guys, a lot of people's matches were like knockdown, drag out, slugfest of death. But on a regular show, that's not really going to work. You'll burn your crowd out like in five minutes. It's your first match, just just like your main event. And I, I may have picked up a, I may have picked up one or two moves while I was there as well. I ain't. I'm not admitting to that. I came up with everything I do. Darn it. I don't steal moves. I'm just kidding. Um, I disagree. Chris Jericho invented everything, by the way. Yeah, that's true. So whatever I do, I stole it from Jericho. Anyway. I learned how to... I learned even more so how to slow down, especially because of the kind of match that I was in. I, I pretty much worked a totally different style. Like, if you see the match, like, I didn't even do it during that match. I was so, like, I was half nervous, half overly focused, half worried, like, oh, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. Luckily, everything went well. So just little stuff like that. And then, uh, who was it? I think it was Ethan Case. He told me about, this is, and this is one thing I learned directly from somebody saying directly to me, is just, being more vocal. It's another thing that I've always needed to work on is being louder. I'm loud as crap before the match starts, and then during the match, I, sometimes I just I forget. 
And I'm like, oh, wait, I need to keep that loudness on the whole time. So little things like that. Very, very, I'm once again, like, super, super, super thankful to Black Baron for asking me to be a part of that. Hopefully they do it again and I get to be a part of it again. By then I'll be an even better wrestler than I was when that happened because I get better every day. Somehow, whether it's from the gym or studying too much, but every day, that's all I do. That's all I think about. Awesome, awesome experience. Everyone should do it. Every everybody that's a pro wrestler that's worth something should should try and get a spot and be on wrestling. You can tell them I said that. You can tell them I said I want to be on there again, so I'm trying to hide from you. <laughs> Now, uh, Matt, before we uh, take this home, you and I discussed something that happened in TNA off air, uh, a title change. If you will, mm-hmm. tell everyone what the hell happened for those that missed out. Spoiler alert. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago at a house show, the TNA tag team titles changed hands between the Bromans, who were the champions, and the Wolves, who have been in the company for, oh, just about three weeks. Yep. Yeah, so, how show title change? I know it's supposed to show that anything can happen at a house show, but what the fuck are you thinking, TNA? <laughs> what the fuck? Wait, so what happened? The titles change, the tag team titles are now in, as you know, Okay, this is where it gets confusing. So, according to whatever fucking mystical powers that be, let me actually check TNA's website. Um, the tag team champions, as of right now, are supposed to be the Wolves. But they okay. just taped a pay-per-view in Japan where the Wolves lost the tag team titles Correct. back to the Bromans. Oh. And that taping will not take place... Oh, oh, sorry, that will not air until, like, March or June. Hmm. Confused yet? That's confusing. Yeah, that's (laughs) extremely confusing. That makes my head hurt. As of... Okay. So, okay. What makes it even more confusing is that that taping is going to air in June, July, and according to TNA's website... The Bromans have been champions since March 2nd, so they're acknowledging it on TV. Hmm. And I think my head is about to fucking explode. Yeah, me too, because that's really confusing. Impact Wrestling, where the bullshit never ends. Wait a minute, does that mean that they're actually going to have them lose the title again, but we're like, oh, well, this is the one... They lost the title again when really it's the one they lost before. This is... This is this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is just the uh, the uh, I don't know, the pre-com of uh, <laughs> of TNA. <laughs> wow! Oh, Jesus like Christ! Title and by the way, don't forget Sonata is now the X Division champion. Yeah, because when TNA aren't dropping the belts between Chris Sabin and Austin Aries, somebody else has to come in. There you go. Although I kind of like the fact that the the X Division Championship is uh, so hotly contested for, even though it is overkill, because obviously they still have the option C, which TNA don't even need anymore, because there's fucking briefcases running around all over the fucking place. They yeah. got they got the fucking Feast of Fired stuff. Which um, the world title's already been cashed in, and he lost. Mm-hmm. X Division, I don't think it's been cashed in yet, but I don't watch TNA because I I, 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 I treasure my fucking sanity. Um, tag team title case is with Ethan Carter, and hasn't been cashed in on yet, and they still have option C. So, 
Uh, got taken care of back with Chris Saban. He took care of that and actually won it. Um, yeah, I've yeah, got the but no, no, no. Option C, uh, option C keeps on rolling over. Yeah, at the next destination, next pay per view. But TNA keep on making it sound like it can happen at any time, which we all know is bullshit. But of course, it's. It, t- it's let me give you this real quick here, I'm playing spoiler here kids so if you don't want to hear spoilers about this show close your ears for the next 18 seconds from the TNA versus Wrestle 1 outbreak pay-per-view that took place on March 2nd from what I was told Christopher Daniels and Kazarian defeated Minoru Tanaka and Koji Kanemoto Gil Kim defeated Madison Rain, so that technically we're 50-50 on that one Takayama and Abyss went no contest and slammed, um, used uh, the ch- tax and choke slam Takayama on the tax. Both men could not answer the 10 count. Bobby Roode did the job to Mas- um, Masakatsu Funaki. Funaki then turned around and challenged Kurt Angle to a match after he beat Bobby Roode. Kaji Muto, Rob Terry, and Taioke defeated Samoa Joe, Rene Dupree, and Masayuki Kono. When Joe, oh, Dupree, what, 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 Jesus Christ, Rob Terry and Rene Dupree, talk the about, Rene Dupree. yeah, Jesus Christ. And this is where um, Saya Sonata defeated Austin Aries to win the uh, X Division champion. The there were actually three out of I believe eight matches where TNA um, based individuals won their matches. Magnus retaining against Kai or KIA, KAI, Kai to retain the, um, the world heavyweight championship. Other than that, the TNA guys basically did the JOB over to the Wrestle One guys. Which it I'm wasn't... not surprised. I, I, I'm actually not surprised because Wrestle One's a fledgling company and they need all the help they can get over there. Yeah, but by the way, for what? I can understand them running a 50-50 split, but for it to be bal- tipped to the balance of power to wrestle one, dude, does that, uh, after what happened in the UK with all, they had some decent outings as long as they didn't have frickin' Dixie, by God, Carter out there 21 times an hour. <laughs> all mean, I'm saying is that judging by what I heard for the, um, the, U- uh, the London leg of the, uh, tapings, I'm f- I'm fucking glad I dodged that bullet. <laughs> <laughs> and go figure this: TNA has a pay per view this coming Sunday. Allegedly, they're actually going to do a real pay per view this Sunday. I am so excited! Said no one. Wait, they pay per view. They have a pay per view well, lockdown. Lockdown is this coming Sunday. Here's the lineup. Magnus versus Joe for the title inside a cage. These are all cage matches. Lethal lockdown. Oh, yeah, yeah. Team uh, Team Dixie, Rude Aries, and the Bromance taking on Team M- MVP, MVP the Wolves, and, hmm, gee, wonder who that mystery person's going to be. Knockouts title, Madison Reigns. Uh, Willow. Defense. Huh? It's Willow. Yes, Willow up his ass. <laughs> Madison <What? laughs> Madison... <laughs> Hearing, damn it, doom, be the cra- midget from Willow. There you go. Um, in a steel cage match, Gunner versus Storm. Eric, up uh, Eric Angle. Holy hell, where the hell was I at? Kurt Angle Survivor versus Survivor Series e- 2000, apparently. Yeah, really. Um, Kurt Angle versus EC3. Anderson versus Samuel Shaw. I like Ken Anderson, but Samuel Shaw is showing me nothing. I'm sorry, but the, here's one. Bad influence and Chris Sabin taking on the Great Muda, Sonata, and Tigre Uno. That will steal the Great Muda? I think it's his son. I think it's Muda too, isn't it? Matt? No, I think it's the original. The, okay, guess what? That, this match, this one match would probably, uh, let's see, hold on. Magnus Joe, pay per view anytime. Kurt Angle, Derek Bateman, EC3 should be pay per view quality. The six-man steel cage tag team match with Bad Influence, Saban, Muda, Sonata, and Tigre Uno should be pay-per-view quality. Gunner James Storms has, has been played too many times on TV. The, the knockouts thing has been played on TV. And the only high part of this is actually getting to watch MVP and the Wolves work. If I mean, it's going to be Jeff Hardy. You know in your heart it's going to be Jeff Hardy. Even if you've read the spoilers, you know it's going to be Jeff Hardy. It's not going to be Jeff Hardy. It's going to be Willow. I don't care if it's oh. Malibu Barbie. 
it's Malibu Stacy. Spark now, now, if it's Stacy Keebler, hello, legs. Okay, so it's going to be what? Bobby Roode, Austin Aries, and the Bromans versus MVP, the, the Wolves, and Waylon Smithers. How about Waylon Jennings? Nah, yeah, Smithers. How about the ghost of Hank Williams Sr.? They'd How win. about the ghost of Christmas past? Ooh. About Ooh. The, the How about the ghost of <laughs> <laughs> How about the ghost of WCW? They'd lose. Oh, no. oh, how about no, like, the gay ghost? Like, ooh. Wait a minute. Well, how about, how so about weird. The, thank you. How about the uh, California ghost or the ghost of California Christmas past? How about the ghost of Buff Bagwell's career? You got to call his mom for that seance. <laughs> <laughs> how about the ghost Judy, of Judy Stevens Bagwell? I <laughs> love you, Judy. <laughs> We should call Judy right now. I have her on speed. <laughs> you have her on speed dial. Yeah. I have her on my cell phone because uh, the time that we did the interview with Buff Bagwell here on Beyond Ringside, which, Wick, you were there for that. You can vouch for this crap. <laughs> oh, dear God, was I ever there for that. The most <laughs> awkward interview ever. That was a cluster Uh-oh. bang and a half. Oh, by the way, for the record, the ghost of California, uh, the California ghost would be boo. Totally boo, dude. Okay. Wow. The ghost of Chase Stevens' balls. <laughs> lost those to a strip card game up in Tennessee. He lost them as soon as he ran away from Kit Cash. Most people would run away from Kid Cash. Yeah, I've heard they got pretty bad ass. Okay, it's time. Eddie, how can everyone time? get in touch with you, sir? It's Vader time. How can everyone get in touch with you, and what do you have upcoming on Beyond Ringside, Eddie? Uh, the rundown for the calendar, easy. Tomorrow night, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time, 8 p.m. Eastern, Cause and Effect present the Thursday night radio throwdown. I do believe Global Championship Wrestling may be going on at 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern. The Saturday Showcase with yours truly, um... Hitman Big Daddy Cool Ryan Adcock and Robert Cosper goes live at 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern this coming Saturday. And Beyond Ringside Live will be on a one-week hiatus. In other words, I have a paying job this coming Sunday, and I want the money. (laughs) So BR BR Live will be back one week from this coming Sunday and working on projects right now for Back to Basics this coming Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern. For me personally, find me at FastEddieLane, L-A-Y-N-E dot com. There's a ghost of Twitter past and a ghost of Twitter present, but we don't know if there's going to be a ghost of Twitter future at, at Fast Eddie Lane, but I'm also on Instagram at Fast Eddie Lane. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody this coming Friday night. Buffalo Wild Wings in Alabaster, 9 p.m. start time, and we're going to have some fun. There's some pent-up frage and ruthless aggression. and uh, Pent-up frage? Holy freaking hell, what did I say? Creme frage. There you go. Um, I do want to say, and you can probably hear at the other end of the house, uh, my roommate Mike, um, birthday today on March 5th. Mike, congratulations. You're old. And I think... I think you're officially older than me for about another 10 months. But <laughs> I just want to say, guys, this has been fun. I really appreciate it because when you've had a weird week like I've had, especially with what happened Sunday night at a bar that will no longer be named or mentioned by me in any capacity whatsoever, other than if I want to put the word blows big time behind it, um, it's very cathartic to be able to just take off the kid gloves and let it rip. And I know that I didn't normally go with the language protocol that normally follows on this show, but I did have a great time. Thank you very much for putting up with me. Ah, you sentimental bastard, you. Keep going. <laughs> Matt didn't. Matt, how can everyone get in touch with you, sir? And what do you have upcoming? I know you have a few tricks up your sleeve. As for how you can get in touch with me, you don't. Tumblr. That's a lie. You have a Twitter. No. Oh. He doesn't use Twitter anymore. No, I don't. Oh, you don't use your Twitter? Come on. Although I you did comment on Twitter a few minutes ago. You were called incomparable by I'm a wrestling fan. Oh. There you go. Well, thank you for letting me know because I didn't see it. 
Yeah, when I was over with the offering side account doing build up and um, push for the show, I was making a reference to who all's on tonight. And I'm a wrestling fan, came back and said, you know, they appreciate the factor of uh, true veterans in professional wrestling like Wick, Tosh, and myself. And the, um, I'm a wrestling fan. Immediately came back and said, and never discount the um, never discount the words of the incomparable um, words from Prism. Oh wow! Thank you. We must have like the biggest and most loyal uh, female wrestling fan following of any podcast, any wrestling radio show, like, hands down. Am I correct? Probably. Probably. Yeah. I think we do, and okay. we, we appreciate every single one of y'all, even the guys with the penises. <laughs> oh, yeah, and by the way, I think uh, this will be a great time for uh, Doom to throw out his hashtag, BBC. Yes, Big bone chicks. No? no. <laughs> that was I like that one, fat bottom girls. Uh, Doom, how can everyone get in touch with you, sir? And uh, what do you have upcoming? There's lots of ways to get in touch with me. Twitter and Instagram are both Doom Trevor Eon, all one word, D O O M T R E V E R A E O N. Twitter and Instagram, Doom Trevor Eon. When you get on Instagram, you can also hashtag Eonstagram if you have crazy pictures of me or cool stuff like that, because I know some of you do. Uh, YouTube, TA Facekick, youtube.com, backslash TA Facekick. All my matches that have been recorded are on there. The ones that aren't, I post on there, so uh, pay attention. Facebook.com slash Trevor Eon. Once again, T-R-E-V-E-R-A-E-O-N. All those awesome promoters out there that totally want Trevor Eon at your wrestling event. Trevor Eon at gmail.com. Tell me where you are and uh, get me on your show because I kick people in the face and art is violence and I bring the doom and everybody likes me or everybody hates me. You know, whatever. Whatever you want. I don't care. <laughs> um, am I leaving anything out? I think those are all yeah, the ways. Chairman's to extension. That too. Uh, this weekend on Friday, I'm going to be. Uh, First show of a new company, Center Stage Pro Wrestling. I'm pretty excited about it. Wrestling Fred Yeh again. It's going to be in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, go to the CSPW website, and they it has pretty much all the information you need. On Saturday, along with Wicked Nemesis and Clyde Braddock, I'm going to Empire Wrestling once again. Last time I was there, I wrestled Johnny Viper. The time before that, I think I wrestled Xander Stone. It's been a while. Can't wait to go back up there. It's going to be in Rossville, Georgia. Once again, Empire website on Facebook will give you all the information. Empire Wrestling Entertainment is what they are. I'm pretty excited. That is all the crap. Oh, yeah, wait, wait. I'm leaving something out. I have a DeviantArt account, too. DeviantArt.com slash Doom Trevor Eon. E-O-O-M-T-R-E-V-E-R-A-E-O-N. I'm going to post art on there because it's the DeviantArt website. Duh. Eddie, Eddie, go right ahead, sir. If I may, this is something I meant to say a minute ago, but I got kind of chuckled at something that happened i didn't really say this i know we said it kind of on sunday and we did i did say a little bit of it last night on back to basics but i know that i speak for wick for trevor for clyde and the entire gcw underground foundation locker room when i say thank you to everybody who came out this past saturday night to the pelham civic complex because there were some hellacious fans at the civic complex for March mayhem. There were some great, there were some great wrestling fans there, not sports entertainment fans, not general hospital fans. (laughs) Yeah, because there was some drama there too. We just think we've already talked about it. (laughs) Let it rip, let it rip. I effing dare you. I'll even drop the F bomb, but seriously, I mean, to everybody who came up where I was bouncing around like a freaking pinball half the time, but to people who came up and asked if they could take pictures with me, to people who came up to ask for autographs, to everybody who came up and made the reference um, to say that they listened to Beyond Ringside, whether it be BR Live, Back to Basic, Saturday Showcase, C&E, and of course TBD, because I had people coming up and saying that they listened to, the, um, to all the shows on the network on a regular basis, and when they get it, um, especially when they get a chance to as well, and it's humbling. I mean, to be able to put faces, it, it really is. Because when you get a chance to put faces with the, with the words and the screen names that you've never met before, it's like, dude, 
Last week on TBD, off the charts. Dude, last week on BR, you, Mabo, and Wick just nailed it. And, you know, when they're talking about the different shows and the different characters that we have, that, and the thing about it is we're not just characters. We are who we are on these shows, legitimately. Pretty much. I mean, we don't put on facades for on-air personalities. We're not living gimmicks. We're being ourselves on these. We're and, all fantastic personalities, that's why. Yes. And everybody knows that Wicked Nemesis is a warm and wonderful person. <laughs> Especially when he's awake, right, Wick? No, but in all seriousness, everybody who did come up, thank you. Because, you know, for all the kind words that have been said about all the shows here on this on the station and on the network, they are appreciated. And I think for the entire Beyond Ringside family of shows, thank you for listening. Jesus Christ, you really are a sentimental bastard. Let's shut you up. <laughs> that was you just zipper. You just caught my balls in the zipper, you ass. <laughs> you can find me at Wicked Nemesis on Twitter, Wicked Nemesis Enoch on YouTube. There is a Facebook fan page for Wicked Nemesis, The Unlucky Charms, and the To Be Determined Show, and of course, The Merchants of Death. Next Wednesday, I have something in the works. Maybe it'll come through. Maybe it won't. You know, it is the To Be Determined Show after all. We want to thank Clyde Braddock for coming on. Tasha sends her regards. She said her phone messed up, which, I mean, it always does about about does. once a month. It seems to go. Exactly. So, uh, <laughs> so, Doom, we do appreciate you coming on and guest co-hosting once again. Uh, so, Ooh. hey, we will see you Saturday night. Rossville, Georgia Empire Wrestling for Fast Eddie Lane. Have a great week. I'll see you, uh, see you Saturday morning on uh, the uh, Saturday Showcase and Friday night at Buffalo Wild Wings. For Doom, Trevor Eon. Artist Violence, Ian. For Mad Dog, Matt Denton. Shameless plug, and I'm not even getting paid for this. Go buy South Park The Stick of Truth. It's a fucking great game. Cool. <laughs> this it, is the Orca. Uh, you have not lived. Sorry. You have not lived until you see Mister Slave just bounding around and shoving a fucking fifteen-foot spider up his asshole. Yes, that really happens. And shameless plug that I'm not getting paid for. For those who are looking for genuinely brilliant web design, get in touch with Matt Denton. Thank you. I need the money. Yes, Matt Denton does web design, and he is fantastic at it. Please make sure you go out and support local independent wrestling. Make sure you go out and you check out Seeing Red Again. That is a great song, and it is a great way of life, period. I am the Orc of Ominous, the architect of Inner Lake. This is the To Be Determined show, and turn down for what? <laughs>